Wales, a wild and rugged land with a rich vein of history, myths and legend. The railway travels through the heart of it all and modern sprinters transport you from the English borders through the mountainous heart of this ancient land. Preserved steam also lives on, and there are plenty of other attractions on the way to the spectacular coast of South Wales. Our journey from England into Wales follows the Heart of Wales line down to Swansea and Pembroke. We begin in Shrewsbury, Shropshire's splendid county town which nestles in a wide loop of the River Severn. Shrewsbury's imposing Gothic station replaced the original, which was built in 1848 to serve a number of small local railways. These were the Shrewsbury and Birmingham, the Shrewsbury and Chester, the Shrewsbury and Hereford, and the Shropshire Union Railways. The town soon became the hub of a network of lines which radiated in every direction. Shrewsbury is almost completely surrounded by the River Severn. The only opening is guarded by the castle which stands opposite the station. This dates from Saxon times but was strengthened by the Normans and rebuilt by Edward I in 1300. Today it houses the museum of the Shropshire Regiment. English Bridge is one of two major bridges over the River Severn. In 1083, a Benedictine Abbey was founded here. It was dissolved in 1540, and many of the monastic buildings were destroyed. Only the Abbey Church and a pulpit have survived. The Shrewsbury Quest is a recreation of monastic life. This was home to the fictional sleuth, Brother Cadville, and the quest brings his enigmatic world to life. Following in Cadville's footsteps, visitors can live the history, solve a mystery, and even create their own decorated manuscript. In the monastic gardens, there is a collection of herbs and plants dating from the 12th century, the only garden of its kind in England. Shrewsbury town is also full of history, stretching back over a thousand years. There's a medieval church on almost every corner, and the narrow streets are threaded between Tudor and Georgian buildings.
This is one of the few towns to survive the Victorian craze for modernization. Charles Darwin, who developed the theory of evolution, is commemorated with a statue outside his old school. We leave Shrewsbury on a single carriage sprinter introduced in the late 80s for modest services such as the Heart of Wales line. The history of the line began in the 1850s when the London and North Western Railway was keen to have access to the lucrative South Wales coal traffic. They supported the development of a line into Wales from Shrewsbury and the first section was opened by the independent Knighton Railway in 1861. South of Shrewsbury the Shropshire Plain rises sharply. 900 million years ago molten lava formed the Rekin and Stretton Hills. On the rocky summit of Caer Caradoc are the earthwork remains of an Iron Age hill fort. Here, Caradoc, otherwise known as Caractacus, made a heroic last stand against the Roman army. In the valley below is Church Stretton, the first stop on the long journey south. Church Stretton is the prettiest of three Strettons, which are strung out beneath the escarpment of the Long Mind. The half-timbered houses date from the town's boom time, when mineral springs provided the basis for a Victorian health resort. Beyond the town, the secluded carding mill valley cuts deeply into the hills. This is the Long Mind, a six-mile range of rounded sandstone moorland. Ideal walking country. The broad and undulating plateau rises to nearly 1,700 feet and much is owned by the National Trust. Farmers in the surrounding villages have the right to graze their sheep and ponies on the common land. The town of Knighton straddles the border. The station is in England, but the town is firmly in Wales. The area has been occupied since the Stone Age, but today Knighton is a bustling market town whose focal points include a 19th century clock tower and the traffic-free Narrows. 
In keeping with border town tradition, this is a place with plenty of history, much of it violent. Old Knighton is built from timber as well as from stone. There are two castles as well as the famous Offa's Dyke, an ancient earthen wall and ditch which ran for much of the length of the border. Knighton has one of the best preserved sections of the dyke. In 1971, the 168 mile long Offa's Dyke long distance path was officially opened here. High in the hills above the town, there's another surprise, a unique public observatory. In 1865, the Central Wales Railway continued the line from Knighton to Chlandrindod. <laughs> Nucleus Viaduct, built in 1864, has 13 great arches and is guarded by towers which mirror the medieval castle behind. At its peak, this line carried 18 passenger trains a day in both directions. By the 1950s, traffic had dwindled. Several formal applications for closure followed, all to no avail. The line passes through a number of marginal constituencies, and so far, no government has dared to risk the political backlash from closing the line. Clandrindod Wells takes its name from the mineral springs which bubble up from the ancient rocks below. It was to these wells that the railway brought visitors in their thousands during the Victorian and Edwardian eras. Here they sought magical cures for a wide variety of ailments. With this boom came an explosion of building in the guise of hotels, pavilions and arcades. Today the town is a time warp of Victorian architecture. This striking Art Deco building is the Automobile Palace, built in 1906 by Tom Norton, one of the first car dealers in Wales. He also brought aviation to the area. The main spa is in the rock park, where the pump room offers three different varieties of water, saline, sulphur and magnesium. For those who like to take it easy, there are always walks in the gardens or a spot of fishing on the lake. Clandrindod Wells is renowned for its Victorian festival, which takes place every August. For locals and visitors, it's a chance to dress up in the costumes of the period and to enjoy some traditional entertainment.
A few miles away is the Elan Valley, one of the most beautiful parts of Wales. This is a major catchment area for Welsh water and provides a haven for birds, including buzzards and the rare red kite. In 1868, the route was completed with the extension to Hlendavri. Today, Brilth Road Station is a private house, but its dogs still provide a welcome for the trains. The town of Brilth Wells stands on the River Wye. This was another Victorian spa town, which has its origins in Norman times, when a castle was built to guard the ancient river crossing. In 1277, the town was granted a royal charter, and there's been an important market here ever since. In 1992, a circle of standing stones was laid out in order to proclaim the visit of the National Aesthetic of Wales. Prominent buildings include the medieval church of St. Mary and the Wyside Arts Centre with its terracotta heads. On the other side of the town, the River Irvine flows down to meet the River Wye and a series of bridges provide some pleasant walks. At Kilmary, a monument commemorates the death of Llewellyn, the last true Prince of Wales who was killed by the English in 1282. Further on is the summit at Sugarloaf Mountain. Here, a small halt caters for walkers. The line emerges from a tunnel high on the side of the valley with views to the Black Mountains and beyond. Passengers can enjoy one of the best railway views in Britain. In the valley below at Kangorvi, there's a magnificent 18-arch stone viaduct over the river Brum.
Beyond the mountains is the Brecon Mountain Railway. This was originally operated by the Brecon and Merthyr Tydfil Junction Railway. It was closed in 1964. This was one of the most scenic railways in Britain. In 1980, a section was reopened as a two-foot gauge tourist line. This is Graf Schwerin Löwitz, an 062 well tank locomotive built by Arnold Jung of Germany in 1908. The train is made up from carriages which were built by the railway's own workshops based on the frames and bogies of South African freight wagons. From Pant Station, the line runs along the Pontstikil Reservoir and into the Brecon Beacons National Park. Back to the heart of Wales. This section of the line was built by the Llanechli Railway and Dock Company. The line now follows the widening river Tawi to a small station at Llanwerda. This area was subject to serious territorial conflict between the Great Western and the London and North Western Railways. Beyond the village are the Dolokothi gold mines. The whole site is protected by the National Trust and the original structures have been restored with the shaft headgear and buildings from North Wales. They are regular guided tours for visitors and the first thing they learn is that it was the Romans who discovered gold here back in 75 AD. They excavated the whole of the mining area, about half a million tons of rock and recovered about three quarters of a ton of gold. Gold was rediscovered in Victorian times when James Mitchell developed the drift mines into the hill. Now, uh, over there as well, got a little ripple wet. You want to that one? So you can imagine now two walls used to the ocean floor at one stage, then being forced up to its current position. Mind your head on the gate. Just 
The tour over, visitors can have a go at panning for their own gold. Continuing south down the valley of the Tawi, the lion crosses the river several times before arriving in Khandeda. Clandelo is full of character with plenty of unusual shops and buildings. In 1996, this was chosen as the venue for the National Aesthetic of Wales. This annual festival of Welsh music and literature is a showcase for Welsh culture. But there's also a great deal more. Welsh is reputed to be the oldest living language in Europe. It's still taught in schools and is in everyday use in many parts of Wales. The Arts and Crafts Pavilion, with its exhibition of over 400 works, is powerful evidence of the living tradition handed down from Celtic times. The sleepy village of Khlam Dubai is our last stop before the railway junction at Khanechli. the train reverses to take us across the Gower Peninsula to Swansea and another steam railway. This is the Lochor estuary and one of Britain's last wooden railway bridges. Over the water is the Gower Peninsula. The magnificent coastline and superb sandy beaches led to the area being designated as Britain's first area of outstanding natural beauty. At the southern end of Rosilli Bay is the island of Worms Head, a rugged headland with the appearance of a serpent.
Swansea, or Arbor Tawy, is an important railway centre with regular trains from the English and Welsh capitals. The single units from the heart of Wales terminate here and the passengers disembark. Swansea is a city of contrasts. A 14th century castle jostles for position with buildings of every style and period. Its wealth was built on copper. Vikings, Romans, Normans, industrialists, evangelists and even modernists have all left their mark here. Swansea's most famous son is Dylan Thomas, one of the greatest of all the Welsh poets and writers. His bronze statue sits outside the theatre which bears his name. Swansea's award-winning maritime quarter has a distinctly continental air about it. South Dock was built during the copper trade boom in 1859, but the old barges have been replaced by holiday craft. The marina basin can berth up to 600 boats and their regular boat trips from the quayside. The quarter is also home to the Swansea Maritime and Industrial Museum. There are boats, motorbikes and even steam engines. The museum has the largest collection of floating exhibits in Wales. The Helic Lightship was built in 1937 was once moored 10 miles off Mumbles Head. Canning was the last steam tug to operate in the Bristol Channel. The horse-drawn carriage is from the Swansea and Mumbles Railway, the first passenger railway in the world. There's also a car from Swansea's old tramway system. In 1816, an even earlier tram road carried coal down the Swansea Valley. By 1845, Scott's tram road had developed into the Swansea Vale Railway, and now it has emerged as part of the new wave of preserved steam railways. An 040 saddle tank is steamed up outside the Upper Bank Works. 
This old Swansea Vale depot is now part of the growing new railway centre. The saddle tank was built by Packard and Sons of Bristol in 1914. It was delivered new to Mont Nickel at Clydach on Towy. In the 1970s, it was retained as a spare and steamed on works open days. When it arrived at Upper Bank in 1991, it was something of a local celebrity, having spent its whole career in industrial service at the same location. Having made up a train, the packet departs for Six Pit Junction in order to pick up some passengers. At Six Pit, work is underway on a new platform. This site accommodates much of the railway's rolling stock, including a steam crane and a Great Western tank engine, while a four-wheel Ruston diesel acts as works shunter at Upper Bank. Finally, everything is ready for the passengers as they board the shuttle train for Cum Crossing. Swansea has a wide sweeping bay with a popular sandy beach. Out at sea, the Bristol Channel is busy with boats and ships. Motor vessel Balmoral is a traditional pleasure cruiser built in 1949 and owned by the Paddle Steamer Preservation Society. She's kept busy throughout the summer running trips to every port and pier in the Bristol Channel, including many of the islands. At 
At the other end of Swansea Bay is the Mumbles, an impressive headland with a Victorian pier. The pier is one of only 34 left in Britain. Here, the rise and fall of the tide is the second highest in the world. Back to Swansea Station to continue our journey along the coast of South Wales towards Carmarthen. The line to Carmarthen was built by the Bury Port and Gwendreth Railway in 1869 and served a number of industrial branch lines. Bury Port was already served by the South Wales Railway. A new harbour has been built in 1832 in order to export the local coal and iron. There were also copper works here. In 1928, Amelia Earhart landed in the bay here, the first woman to cross the Atlantic by air. A little further up the coast is the Pembry Country Park, a vast expanse of sand dunes and woodland which was once occupied by an old armaments factory. The ordnance factory was equipped with a two-foot gauge railway system part of which has survived as an attraction for visitors. The park contains one of the best beaches in Wales and throughout the summer, there's plenty of traditional entertainment. For the more athletic, there's even a dry ski slope. Kidwelly dates from 1106, when Henry I gave land to the Bishop of Salisbury. The castle is one of a series of defensive positions along this coast. The local population were not enthusiastic about their Norman landlords, and the town was destroyed several times as it changed hands in the wars between the English and the Welsh. In later times, Kidwelly became an industrial town. The heavy industry has now disappeared, but a great deal has been preserved in the Kidwelly Industrial Museum. The town was once dependent upon shipbuilding, mining, quarrying, and tin plate. The museum occupies the site of the old tin works, which closed in the 1950s. As well as the rolling mill and coal complex, there are also a number of industrial locomotives here.
Beyond Kidwelly, the line follows the shores of the Towie estuary. With the development of the railway, the small fishing village of Ferryside became a popular venue for day trippers, especially with the miners from the Ronda. Across the water is Chlanstevan and its imposing Norman castle. Carmarthen is the home to the Gwilly Railway, another preserved line. The town of Carmarthen was first settled by the Romans, but the present layout is centered on the remains of a medieval castle. Bronwith Arms Station stands on the old Carmarthen and Cardigan Railway. This part of the line was originally built to Brunel's broad gauge in 1860. It was closed just over a hundred years later. In 1978, a section of the line was reopened by the Gwilly Railway Company and steam trains were back in business. This is Welsh Guardsman, an austerity saddle tank built by Robert Stevenson and Hawthorns for the War Department in than Kerrig, the guardsman must run around a train for the return. But there's also a connection with a miniature railway.
Further west, the trains cross the River Taff, a tidal river which soon widens out into a broad estuary. On the estuary itself is Lochan, where a mighty castle stands high above the marshland and creeks. This peaceful town, with its mixture of Georgian houses and cottages, is where Dylan Thomas lived and worked for many years. The boathouse and his writing shed, where he wrote under Milkwood, overlook the sea. Still heading for Pembroke, we soon arrive at the railway junction of Wetland. On the outskirts of the town is Whitland Abbey, now used as a retreat. Whitland, we climb up the Vale of Lampeter on the old Pembroke and Tenby Railway. At the village of Narberth, the line heads south. Not far away is Oakwood, the biggest theme park in Wales. A miniature railway runs between the car park and the rides, with motive power provided by 15-inch gauge diesels. Descending the valley of Ford's Lake, the railway heads for Kilgetty. Avondale Glass is a small craftsman's workshop. It's open to visitors who can watch the fascinating process of glass making. Tenby is a popular seaside resort, and its pretty harbour is a favourite subject of painters and photographers. The town itself is still protected by ancient town walls. The narrow medieval streets are full of character, and there are two magnificent beaches.
Pembroke and the end of the line. The town lies on the river Clethow, which flows into the sheltered waters of Milford Haven, one of the most protected natural harbours in the world. Henry VII, founder of the Tudor dynasty, was born in the castle. This fortress was so strong that Cromwell's cannons failed to break it and the royalists had to be starved out. Beyond the town is the rest of Pembrokeshire, an area rich in history and Britain's only coastal national park. A fitting finale to a magnificent railway journey.